Hi, I'm John from Scan of the Month. Today, for a very special edition of Scan of the Month, we'll be talking about the evolution of the iPod, talking about the design decisions, the product decisions that went into it with the help of some great CT scans. And I'm joined today by a very special guest, the creator of the iPod, Tony Fidel. Great to have you on. It's great to be here. Thank you. It's so awesome. We have, we have a few different uh, generations lined up. We have a, an iPod Classic, as it's called now, first generation with the moving wheel. We have a sixth generation iPod Classic, and we have an iPod Nano. So love to just take a look at some of these scans and see, uh, see what they make you think about. Yeah, I, you know, it, I remember when we first started and when having x-ray machine, we didn't even have one at Apple, I think, at the time. We had to go acquire one over the, over the subsequent generations. But uh, we didn't have that at the beginning. Wow. So it's really wonderful to see these scans and everything on products I never really saw that on. You saw the stuff going in, but you haven't uh, gotten to look inside and see it all assembled. No, no, yeah. no. It's great to see it when it's all together. So, you know, just looking at these scans, it's just, for me, it's, it's so cool to, you know, not just see the, see the detail and, and all of the, all the pieces. But, you know, I just remember some of the things like, you know, on the hard drive, you know, there's the, there's the bumpers. Mm -hmm. You know, just to, to isolate the hard drive, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So to make sure when you drop it, like right. that was the big thing for, for when we were, um, were doing this is like, yeah, we could make the thing, but we were like so nervous because it's like you set it down like that. Right. And you know what a hard drive is, you know, they're, you know, the fly heights on the heads and everything above the discs, like that could crash a hard drive. Right. So right. like, how do you make sure you don't do that? It's a portable device. Like right. most people didn't have a portable hard drive, right? It was, you know, it was you were always like so precious. This, like you could throw it around. So we had all the bumpers that we had to, uh, to, had to put in there. And then, you know, some of the other things that were really interesting, like here, these, these little slots, that was actually a design detail for the, the metal back, the stainless hmm. steel back. So yeah. here, you know, you have these little tabs and those had to be spot welded in and they had to still be perfect without getting any kind of deformation on the case itself. And so you can actually see in the scans where some of the spot welds were done. And, you know, that was like a real hard task for the whole mechanical team, the, the product design team, to get right in manufacturing. One you know, of the first things that stands out is the, is the metal enclosure. Um, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, seeing real metal on a piece of consumer electronics was a pretty rare thing, right? You saw a lot of plastic painted silver to look like metal at best. Exactly. And, you know, and something actually just not just metal, but polished metal, like yeah. highly polished, you know, laser etched because uh -huh. we, we were one of the very first laser etched products. Those kinds of things were really there. And then, you know, when we when we dive in here a little bit more, you know, we have the we have the bearings. This was the only product that I actually had bearings in it. Uh -huh. After that, we got rid of the bearings and all the other the mechanics. But uh, this one has it here. And then one other really interesting thing is because we had to design it so quickly, you'll notice there's a ton of air inside. Yeah. Just yeah. air everywhere. You know, yeah. like we didn't have any time to optimize and crunch it down to make it so compact. So uh, it's just, it's wonderful to see this old kid that yeah. we all put together in just eight months and, and ship. It's, it's wonderful. One of the things that really strikes you when you look at this uh, in the context of newer uh, portable devices is some of the uh, jacks on here, right? So the, <laughs> the headphone jack coming right out here. Now this was a special contact for the remote control that was in line, right? Well, if you have headphones, you want to be able to, so you could get in and Sony Walkmans had it, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. they, and so we were like, oh, how are we going to do that? And I was like, I remember all the Sony Walkmans have it. So we needed to have some capabilities like that. But then you also had the other connectors, not just the headphone one. You see all the extra contacts, but then mm -hmm. we had the FireWire connector. That's right. Yeah. Which then were in subsequent, the third generation, you know, those were all gone by then. Right. Yeah, tell us how the wheel works. Is there ball bearings in there? So, yeah, yeah. So, so on the wheel itself, you know, there, were, there was, um, first and foremost was a ball bearing, and we had to worry about the rocking on this. If you can mm. see, there was all this tolerance, so we had to make sure we had certain tolerance bearings. We didn't want to have too much rock. In later generations, you know, we wanted the rock because it right. was a click wheel. This was, you know, this was just a wheel with buttons on the outside, right? And so it was nowhere near as integrated. And it really didn't, it felt cheap if this wheel was, was wobbly. Right, right, right. right. Um, and uh, it was another reason why we moved away from this. You know, you get dust in there, all uh -huh, that other uh -huh. stuff. So, but 
you know, it was the wheel that I think was really cool at the beginning. I was like, oh, that's so, so much fun, right? Right. But then over time, everyone understood what it was, but it was even, it was easier and more robust and everything and smaller and, and lighter and to just have a touch, you know, right. a, right. just basically a, a touch screen. The, the generation two, which came out less than a year later, right? Moved to the touch, uh, the touch wheel. Yeah, it, it went to the touch wheel with buttons. So it was, there was touch in the middle and then there were buttons, mm -hmm. uh, there were buttons around here. If yeah. I remember correctly, it was there were there were touch buttons and then uh, touch wheel, so and then the ultimate came together. Right, right, right. So how did you manage to move from the mechanical wheel to the touch wheel so quickly? Was that something in the works, and you went with the mechanical wheel because that was available? No, that was uh, just us seeing all the pr issues that we had in production out in the field and saying yeah. we need to figure out some some other thing right. to do. So it was, you know, right. all of this stuff. There was a, it was a very small skeleton team. And so once we got done, we were already under the next one within nanoseconds um, because we had seen all the issues, but we also wanted to make sure that we were on a one-year heartbeat. Uh -huh. So for every single holiday, there was a one-year heartbeat on each of the families mm -hmm. so that we were always staying ahead and leapfrogging ourselves because we were really worried of Sony or someone else going, ha ha, and then they leapfrog us. Yeah. If we were always leapfrogging ourselves at a very fast pace, it was hard for us to see anybody to catch up to us. Right, right, and, right. Or, or beat us, for that matter. And so we put the pressure on ourselves, didn't worry about the competition as much as, you know, making sure we were making a pro better product each year. Yeah, yeah. So did you see an entire family when you were developing that, a whole, a whole line of iPods that were going to get better and better over a decade, or, or were you racing to do this one? <laughs> well, you have to just remember, I, Apple at the time isn't the Apple you know it today, which is worth you know, two or three trillion dollars, maybe it's even more now. But uh, you know, it wasn't worth that much money, uh, and so we were scrapping things together. That's, you know, we, that's why we didn't have an x-ray machine at Apple, right? Because right. Right? there was only so much money to go around. Now they have labs and labs and more equipment than you know what to do with. But right. um, but each time, you know, it was like we hoped this was going to be a success, but we didn't know it was. And then and literally the first one, we it sold OK, but it only sold to the Mac base because it had a fireware connector on yep. it. And and it had to be connected to a Mac. It wasn't until we got to PC compatibility where it finally took off. But the first products were great for Mac fans and Mac loyalists but not for the rest of the world. So it wasn't until we got a lot of figured out, all, dialed in all the different things, especially the PC connectivity and USB, then it really took off from there. Right. So each time it was like, okay, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And now we'd started to build longer road, longer term roadmaps. But you know, each year it was, just make that one happen. Don't worry too much about the next year. Well, let's take a look at where you wound up about seven years later with, uh, with the iPod uh, Gen 6 here. So I think this came out in, in 2007, is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Like this was, you know, this was the same time as the iPhone. That's right. right. So yeah. this was the kind of the end of the line. This is the, the quintessential iPod classic that was, you know, it was either this thickness or a little thicker if it, mm -hmm. it had the more capacity storage for songs. But this is the, the classic end of the line, like everything had been dialed in, you know, color screens and video and all that stuff. And so now we have that, that we have that scan up, right? Yeah, so. this is it. Still has a, a, a spinning disk hard drive. Yeah, well, that was the only way at that time to be able to get enough, you know, to get hundreds of thousands of songs, uh -huh. you know, because Flash wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't um, dense enough yet. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but interestingly, if we look here, you know, Obviously, this hard drive got smaller the way you connected into the board. You know, here, this is a very simple connection. The other one was like literally like doing an AT drive mm -hmm. with a big little connector with lots of pins. And so you're referring to the connector down here? Yeah, the, the connector drive. that put the connector into the hard drive. It had more um, shock absorbing built into the thing. So we didn't mm -hmm. have to put shock absorbers and big things on the outside. It was more inside that we could do that. We can adjust the, uh, the histogram here on the CT scan and just make this a little bit clearer, bring out some of the internal components. Oh, nice. Here. Yeah, look nice. Through I love that. that. Yeah. And then if you also see, there's a lot, there's a lot uh, less space inside, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We don't have air going around and... Um, yeah, and all you that don't, stuff. don't see any uh, any any wires in there the way that you did in uh, the original iPhone. No wires, just yeah. trying to make it as solid state as you possibly can, even though you had a hard drive inside. Right. Um, you know, 
tiny, very, very small headphone jack, as small as you could get it. We had the 30 pin here on the bottom. You know, that was the crazy iPod um, accessory docks uh -huh. that were in all the hotel rooms and that's everybody right, had that's it. Right. And, you know, it was even in on the original iPhone, right? right. In a few, few generations of the iPhone. How, how long had, when, when was the 30 pin introduced on the iPod? The 30 pin was, if I remember properly, was the third generation. Okay, Third, got third it. generation up after this one. The second one didn't have that yet, but the third generation did. What did it allow you to do? What did the 30 pin connector allow you to do? Well, that was the thing. We, we didn't really, we had the same number of pins, but that was where we thought out. So it had video out. Uh -huh. And it had audio in, and it had audio out, and, and it had analog and digital and digital control, all these kinds of things. Because we were like, let's make sure we get one one connector, and it lasts for a long time. And that's right. why it worked for the iPhone right. as right. well. Right. So that was the, the interesting thing, because if you look at most products today even um, that are, are not Apple, they don't have an accessories ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The iPod started that accessories ecosystem that you made it directly for that 30-pin connector, and then you had things everywhere, and it was like, well, if I don't have an iPod, I can't hook to all of these things around the world, or right. all the things around the world can hook into this. And so that was what really kind of launched things. You know, even if you look at something like Samsung today, or Samsung back in the day, they still don't have those accessory, you know, they might have cases or something, mm -hmm. but they don't have accessory ecosystems like we did when it was wired before, really right. Bluetooth took off and that kind of stuff. So what you're seeing here is really a connector that, that looks out ahead across another 10 years of the, of the product line, including, exactly. the, uh, including the iPhone. Yeah, and we even, you know, on the smaller one, we even put it there. But if we look at the wheel, you can see the, the little switches underneath of the, the wheel itself. You can see the, the touch, the, the board. There we go. See, you can see the outline there. You can see all these little dots. Mm -hmm. And those, were the, those are the, 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 the buttons under each of the, the ones. And if we go a little bit further, like right here, you're going to see the tracks and the traces to actually huh. do the touch connection. And this is still, is this still another pattern of the, the spot welding, like in the, uh, like in the classic, the, the first generation classic? Yeah. Um, again, right. you're going to see these tabs. And so if you see these little tabs, not nowhere near as big as those, but yeah, the same exact architecture that was used for this, which was one stamping back. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would then uh, spot weld in the, the front face where it clicks in. Mm -hmm. It was all the same architecture. So it's pretty amazing what we did in the early days. Yeah. And it was so smart and so, so simple that it just continued on, right? Like, the, the wheel was too complicated, so, you know, the mechanical one. So it got simplified over time. But there are certain things in the design that stayed exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You know, there was still no um, power button. Uh -huh. So there was uh -huh. no power button on any of these, right? That was a big discussion, like, should we have a power button or not, right? Um, but it's, um, but they all had hold on it, right. right? So it was just, there were certain things that we got exactly right the first time, and we didn't have to change. And there's other things, obviously, that... Needed improvement um, for manufacturing, for usability, or for reliability. Yeah, yeah. So it's the hold. The hold switch here was a trip down memory lane for me because I I owned one of these and I remember putting, starting some music, putting the hold on, and then putting it in my jacket pocket, waiting for the bus in Chicago in the winter. And that was when I learned, by the way, that there really is a minimum operating temperature. <laughs> um, yes, there is. Uh, so is there? Yeah, there's a hold button on the uh, on the Nano here as well. So let's go and look at the first generation Nano here. This is actually two years older than the um, iPod Classic that we just looked at. Let's take a look at the scan. So what are we looking at here? So we're seeing literally like what we saw before, but it was a precursor to this one. And it, we, we, were, we had gotten rid of the hard drive and it was just flash. Uh -huh. This one was the, the first actual flash iPod. Everything else, even there was an iPod Mini uh, before this one, and that had a smaller hard drive in it. But this was the very first Flash-only product. It didn't. It only had four gigs. It didn't mm -hmm. even have um, as many gigs as this original one. It held less songs, mm -hmm. but it was so much more. You know, yeah. so much more convenient. You could run. You could. You know. You could take with you anywhere, and you could have the full iPod experience. You know, there was still the the iPod Shuffle at the time. But it didn't have the screen, it didn't have anything. This was a more or less a no compromise as iPod. And yeah. everybody loved it. It was in all the colors, it was crazy. It had the 30 pin on it, the headphone jack, even the hold switch, everything. And it had the full click wheel on it. So you can see here, you can see all the segments for the touch. You can see again the 
the, the, the mechanical buttons underneath the, the front face. What was really interesting about this design, and I don't know if we can see it, but we had that crazy issue on this one because it was so thin and because it, everybody used it so much. We came up with a new test and we had to do a new thing in manufacturing. It was the butt test. <laughs> We'd have to put this in, in and we had to make a jig for it because people would put it in their back pocket and they would sit on it. Uh -huh. And so what would happen is this thing would start to flex. And so what we had to do, and this is a reason why we had to have the x-ray machines back then, was because what was happening was, if you look at um, a lot of the, the chips here, mm -hmm. because it started flexing and it was just a minor flex, some of the ball joints, the BJ solder balls, would uh -huh. actually crack. Huh. Just a slight crack and it would work for a little yeah, while yeah, yeah. and then the, you the ball, the you lose the yeah, connection. Yeah. And so we had to go and get all kinds of x-ray machines. It was just, it was an utter panic. Like, <laughs> what's going on in the field? Things are failing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was literally because people were sitting on them or flexing just a little bit, yeah. just enough for this very thin board to, to flex. Right. So we had to, to use all kinds of crazy technology to figure it out. And then we had to glue all the parts down on the board. Uh -huh. So we didn't just solder them. We glued them so they were much more, uh, they were relying on the glue for the physical connection and then the electrical connection could go through the, the, the ball grid array. And so, and then all the problems went away, but it was a crazy first, in the first kind of three months of, of yeah. a shipping, we had to figure that out. So that, that was really interesting. And that's when we, we had to have x-ray technology to help us to figure out. What but that was the first time you were ever able to bring x-rays into the product development process in this well, it was it, we had some x-rays, but this is what was imperative that we yeah. had to have them because we had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And so we had to look in and we, then we finally started seeing where the balls were failing, those yeah. kinds of things. And now with these scans, everyone can have this superpower. That's right. Like we had back in 2004 or five, something like that. Now you can have it on your desktop to be able to get this and not just for, for problems, but for designing things more compactly. It's, it's just, it's wonderful to have these tools, you know. I wish we had those tools when we were here because we wouldn't have panicked anywhere near as much as we had to then. <laughs> then there we have the battery. You can see here's the flash. Um, and then you can also see the buzzer. See this? We also have the buzzer here, this round, yeah. or this round thing. That was the, the click generator. Click, 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 huh. click, click. So that was a different way of doing the click than doing the click that we did here, which was much more of a standalone component. This one was integrated in the back. So the, the piezo was on the back, and then as it would vibrate, it would vibrate the product. So it right. would kind of act as like a, um, a diaphragm, right? To, so you get a much more robust. Because the click was really important. You had to go click, 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 click. <laughs> And you wanted to make sure it sounded as good. And it, it felt good, but it had to sound good. Because like, right. you right, wanted right. that confidence inspiring. So there was a lot of tweaking and tuning to get that to work. Did this click generator generate the sound and the, and the haptic feedback? Yeah, there, you know, well, there was not really haptic. It was just enough. I see, I see. It was yeah, it, it, yeah. it vibrated enough so you felt a little bit. It yeah. would, but it was no real true haptic. Yeah, there yeah. was you know, in, in that design, it worked. You know, we pulled yeah. it off, and you can see how it, how small the thirty pin connector got right. versus the original thirty pins, which were much bigger. Right, and and also the integrated um, how many chips are gone. Uh -huh. Like we didn't even compare to how many chips. Um, like these were almost using this almost the similar chips. They were very, very similar architectures that were able to, for power supplies and, and mm -hmm. CPUs and all that stuff. So uh, lots of design reuse as we went down the roadmap yeah. over the years. It strikes you when you, when you go through how much uh, space even the smallest headphone jack still takes up here, right? There you go. Down right, and, and there's a reason why there, there was the headphone jack was removed on okay. iPhones, yeah. right? Yeah. Because it takes so much air, or so much space, and it, it's one of the biggest reasons why they failed. Yeah, yeah. Because things would get jammed up there, and these little leaf springs would, you know, eventually wear out, and and all you have those to pull things. lint out of it, and oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was interesting because now there's actually special tools you can buy for an iPhone that have like to clean every port and everything. Like it's a like an accessory for like 19 bucks to right, right, clean right. things. <laughs> it's uh, you know the, everybody loves these devices so. One of the interesting things about this one is it, it this is a preview of um, of a design decision that Apple brought to the uh, to the iPhone later, right? To have all of the cords that are going to come out of it come out of the same end of the product. Right, because what happened was 
was because you had all of the um, you wanted to get the screen to the to be close enough to the top. But mm -hmm. when you you could do it this way because the screen could be to the top, but you would put the the jacks underneath the screen. Right, right. So where you had the room was down here. So you wanted to be able to put the connectors together where you actually had the room to make sure you keep it you know, thin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would much rather prefer it to be up at the top uh -huh. because that just makes the most sense. Right. Um, but that's not what, when you got to these very, very small geometries, you couldn't. We could still do it with this one mm -hmm. because you still had the hard drive thickness. When you right. went to the flash, you know, then yeah, we had yeah, to get yeah. it removed. And then, you know, the subsequent nanos after this got even thinner. Right, right, Crazy right, right. thing, because there's a, still a lot of plastic here, if you look just at that, that top layer. Yeah, we can see some. Yeah, uh, let's look at it in the scan. Some here. So I'm looking, yeah, let's look at that. Um, so we, you can see here's the 30 pin, the, the, the headphone jack, where the power would come in, mm -hmm. right? Because you'd have to charge it through down there. So power we had the supply. power supply. Yeah. But if you also look at the, uh, if we look here, look at how much plastic Mm -hmm. is still on top of this. Mm -hmm. So how do you get it even thinner? So we had to thin out more and more and more and more plastic. And again, the same exact, um, you know, look at the size here. We still have the same exact architecture with the snaps that are, you know, um, spot welded in. Right, right. From this one went all the way to this one. <laughs> you know, and then there was this, then there was a whole new design, which is the right. extruded aluminum, which uh -huh, was that uh -huh. one. But this even worked, this same architecture, Worked across wow. so many things, so it's just sometimes you just uh, you know you design you it right, right the thing. first time you hit it. Yeah, and, you know it just feels good. It feels awesome, good. awesome. Well, this is a fascinating look through these generations of the iPod. It's such a legendary product, and it's uh, covered in your new book, Build. Right? Yes. The, the, yeah. it, we actually talk about this, and we talk about a few other products. But uh, yeah, no, Build's coming out, and uh, we're we're very excited in May for it to hit. We've had a lot of people who've been involved in the projects read it people who weren't, and I've gotten some really, really nice reviews. But it's all about uh, an encyclopedia of mentorship for how to build products. It's not about storytelling about the products. There's a little bit about that. But it's really about the mindset and the things you need to do to create a team to create products like this and the processes around creating products, not just like this, but all kinds of things. So hopefully it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, like these tools can help a lot of design engineers uh, to think about how to do design. We think about build being how to design teams and processes to build great things. Right. Well, Tony Fidel, it's such a pleasure to have you on. Great to look through these Lumafield CT scans with you and, and uh, revisit the design thinking that went into such a legendary product. It's always fun to go back in time. It's, it's great. So thanks, thanks for showing me the insides of these things after all these years. And, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. You got it.